We're we're about we're quite lost. Yeah. Oh, I'm serious. And then how? Yeah, I didn't know. Yeah. Unfortunately, I didn't feel it. Welcome, everyone, to another Center for Southeast Asian Studies talk today. We are very happy to welcome Garrett Kemp. He'll be speaking about his work compiling a two-volume illustrated book about Mads Lang, the Danish merchant who settled in Bali in the 19th century. His two-volume publication focuses on Bali during the 18th to mid-19th centuries and is illustrated with over 500 artifacts from this period. The volumes include the background of early history and kingdoms up to the present and correlate uh, events in Denmark, France, Britain, Netherlands, Java, Lombok, Sumbawa, Singapore, Malaya, Siam, Burma, British India, and China during the time frame. Garrett will highlight some of the hidden messages in the featured artifacts. As an archaeologist, I love artifacts. <laughs> All right, so uh, he'll give you more background specifically on the book, but I did want to point out that Garrett Kam is from Honolulu. He received his BA in 1976 in textiles and art history and an MA in 1987 in Southeast Asian history and the Asian theater from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And he has been performing, teaching, and choreographing Japanese dance since 1975 through the USA and Asia. He's authored many books, articles and exhibition catalogs on Balinese art and culture, which is why some of you are here, I know. Um, and in 1987, he went to Bali on a Fulbright grant and decided he wanted to live there. In 1990, he became the only non-Balinese temple assistant at one of the island's most important temples. We have uh, an advertisement, I believe, we circulated also, which is about Mads Lang, the book, The Bali Trader and Peacemaker and Forgotten Treasures. And it is our great honor and delight to welcome Garrett back home. Thank you very much. And this is your way. <laughs> and there is a oh my God, there you go. You each color. Oh, yeah. Hey, y'all. I'm kind of the first slide, I guess. It's like the title of the presentation. Okay. Uh, uh, that, that, that only goes for us, uh, not for oh. the other people in the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can grab and drag it. What? Yeah, and people in the Zoom cannot see it. Uh, how, do, how do I get rid of it? Because it's crucial to what I'm showing. Mm -hmm. All the tests and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. Uh, you can fix that by sharing only live screen instead of sharing your whole screen. Oh. Share only that window. Those will not appear. Anyway, can you stop? Yeah. <laughs> Put in the share menu. The green. Okay, not share screen. Um, you shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. You will do it so that everybody on Zoom can also see. Mm -hmm. And the view set the view. I don't know. Weird. Come above. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if you're ever living in the city and you're at the beach, then the camera will do the right thing. Mm -hmm. It's voice activated. So when you're talking, it will focus on me. Yeah. Okay, okay there we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Can we just a second? We have to get recording. We already recording. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, sort of a um, a work in progress still yet. Um, the, the book is still is still in kind of a raw state. It's gone to a Second printing in the raw state uh, to make the G20 um, meeting in Bali in November last year it was presented to the delegates uh, who came. Um, right now, we're negotiating for a smaller volume. You can actually see the books on the table afterwards. Um, I'm negotiating for 
smaller, more affordable uh, set of uh, books because the present one sells for 750 US dollars, which is beyond. So I'm presenting this uh, set to the University of Library, University of Holy Library uh, for their collection because they weren't able to and then they did. But um, so Mans Lala, um, Lala, um, Sandina Shah, uh, an entrepreneur um, who will uh, have it on the next slide. Yeah, just I have a sort of a, a timeline to set the background. I don't need to, I think, read for everything. You can sort of see uh, the timeline that sets when he was born and what was going on in, in Europe at that time. So it's a lot of a homogenous um, period when he was born. And um, part of the reason why he left Europe also was to seek more adventure because after the Napoleonic Wars ended, he, um, uh, Denmark was pretty much bankrupted. And so he saw his adventure at the age of uh, 14, he set sail on a ship to go to Asia. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so I'm just on, <clears throat> just uh, look over some of the later things when France uh, took over the Netherlands in these, 1808, and the governor general, um, a Dutchman, but loyal to the Netherlands, uh, loyal to France, um, he had appointed the governor, gen the governor general of the Netherlands East Indies, the Netherlands Indies. And then um, because the British were already in India at that time, they were afraid of rising French uh, colonialism in Southeast Asia. So they invaded um, the, the Indies and installed Raffles as the lieutenant governor. And he made this a, a very harsh um, taxation system. That next next slide. <clears throat> that after the war, the, the British were forced to leave. Uh, then the Dutch returned and they kept going this taxation system that Raffles set up. That led to the Dago War in 1825. Um, but then before all that happened, <laughs> um, of course, uh, the British had defeated Napoleon. And in 1815, you had this massive volcanic eruption in uh, Sumbao, of the Amora volcano. And that pretty much led to the you know, without a summer, you know, the crop failures around the world, mass migrations of people seeking uh, food and, and better in life, a new way of life. So um, it's during that time also, that there was a, afterwards they had the famine in China because um, the crops failed and that led to the growing of opium that eventually caused problems uh, in the United States, which I will cover in the opium war because um, that's beyond the scope of my talk. Um, but it led to mass migrations of, of Chinese into Southeast Asia in particular. So um, one of those families, probably in the 1820s, migrated to Java and then to Bali and became very implemental in um, Matslana, uh, how we operated there. Okay. Um, yeah, so 1825 to 30, the Java War. And this is something I learned uh, during this book was that the Dutch were recruiting mercenaries in Kuta to fight uh, against the, the Javanese. Uh, in the Dutch war, in, in the Java war. Uh, and then soon after that, the war ended. And in 1831, um, George Peacock King came in. He was born in British India and came over uh, as a trader in Papua North and set up a trading post in Bali to export rights to Singapore because after the British left um, the Netherlands Indies, the Raffles went up and established in Singapore in 1819. <clears throat> so they needed a lot of rice and support was growing, population, popularity and everything. So that's when Maslala, I think 1824, he sailed over to the Danish uh, trading post in India on the, um, in 
I'm not at the Paramount Doha coast. And then um, from there, Matslanga set sail over to further east and wound up in, in Lombok. But Lombok, because of the geography of the island, just have one big volcano in the north, the giant. And the south is all fertile breast fields. So after the big eruption, where the, um, I think the, the ash was over a meter in height that covered all the fields, it took at least seven years for it to break down and then the rice start really taking off. Um, so there's this surplus of rice that they needed to set up to, um, to Singapore, where it was needed. Okay. So then Lana comes in a few years later uh, into Lombok, about the same time when when uh, George Picard King also sets up um, a trade post. And there were two rival Balinese Dora houses ruling the island at that time. One from an earlier period that came from Bali, and then they took over the north coast of Bali. It's going to get a little bit complicated. I won't get into the details there, but that house in East Bali conquered the north, north coast of Bali. And then a rival faction in East Bali, the king committed incest and he was exiled to Lomo. So he had two rival houses fighting for power. And King and Langa both supported opposing sides. So eventually, the side that um, Mats Langa supported lost the war. And um, he then shifted his attentions over to Bali. Okay. So that's what's happening to 1830, 1839, you had a two-year civil war in, in Lombok that, um, that uh, King and his royal faction won. Okay. Um, so, uh, 1841, you had the, uh, a Dutch ship wrecked off of South Bali and the King of Bali, because it was a Jewish, there was a tradition among the Balinese to loot the cargo of the wrecked ship as a gift from the god of the sea. Yeah, but because this was a, a Dutch owned ship, and mind you, Bali was not yet a part of the Netherlands Indians at this point. So it's we're talking really pre colonial period, yeah, at this point. So the kings of um, Bali were told not to loot the cargo anymore. Okay. So Maslanga is beginning to prosper and all of this um, chaos. And he marries, 1843, he marries the Balinese princess from Havana. And she's the sister of the king of Havana. And she, he got her pregnant. He actually knew her, her father, but the father passed away soon after um, he arrived. So the son took over as a king, so it's his sister. That's um that's Mas Lama's wife. And as they're getting ready for the cremation of the king, uh he stayed at the palace and impregnated her. So he had to marry her in early 1843. By the end of the year, his first son, William Peter, was born. In next slide. Next slide. Yeah. Okay. So now we get just into some of the, the visual things. This is a Mars Lama's a ship as it arrives off of East Bali. Uh, those who know Bali will recognize this as the part of um, Padang Bai over in the East Coast of Bali. Um, that's the volcano. Um, Lumpuyam. Yeah, Lumpuyam is there. That's the volcano in the background as the ship arrives in um, Padang Bai. And he builds this enormous, uh, they call it a factory in um, what the Dutch called a factory, but it was, a, it was more a process incentive that everybody, farmers, manufacturers, whatever, would bring their goods over to his warehouses. And from there, he would load them onto ships and send them off to Europe, other parts of Asia. Uh, one thing that Mas Lama brought in were the Chinese uh, coins with the holes, the yeah, kepping with the pispolong in Balinese. 
So he he imported tons and tons of these as a ballast for the ships to come in from China and then unload all the coins and then load them up with all the precious ones that the Chinese needed, the spices, huh? the rare woods, the fragrant woods, things from the forests and everything. We ship them off over to China, sandalwood, things like that. Um, so, um, and this became the, the currency for all of, uh, of Asia from India up until um, uh, Qing China. At the back of the coins, you have inscriptions in Mongolian script and in Tamil script on the back of the uh, uh, yeah, coins from China, Chinese coin. And so uh, these were issued during the reigns of, of the emperor that they were issued. So, but they all, the name of the emperor would change, but the inscription on the other side would always be in Mongolian and Tamil script. Yeah, because it was the the uh, the currency for all all of Asia at that point. <clears throat> now, what's that is the the silver ingots, silver ingots that were coming in from Mexico into the Philippines. Yeah. Okay. So the two images above are just um images of his his um factory, warehouse, living quarters for all his um uh, workers, eventually his um. Because Balin's wife did not live with him in Kuta. She was it was below her station to live with um commoners and and um workers and foreigners. So she stayed in the palace of Davana and Matslana had visitation rights all the time. Okay. Uh, next slide. Now we get one of the first artifacts uh, that we find that we that was located uh uh, he, uh, for this book, um, we have Mads Lama there sitting with two of his uh, Dalmatian dogs. <laughs> and he actually uh, brought them in, and you still can see descendants of the Dalmatian dog running all over Kuta with their yeah, spotted coat. Yeah. So this is a portrait image of him um, with uh, the Christmas spears. And sorry, Garrett, I won't, Garrett, sorry, I won't get into the, into the spears and the the weaponry is more about the images that I'm showing all Mats Rana and its life. So he's getting pretty much established fairly well in Kurta, doing very well. He has uh, teams of Balinese women tie up these Balinese, uh, these are Chinese coins into, into strings of 200. And that was the unit that they used, uh, the uh, Sata, Satakan, the 200. Uh, coins that made up a string. And they have all these teams and teams of women just sitting there, bringing together all these hundreds of thousands of coins, maybe millions. We don't know how many coins they actually brought in. And there are these little inscriptions on these uh, sculptures that you see here um, that have his name. Now, the name, uh, neither what I think is that the person who inscribed these uh, little Bold or silver labels was not uh, versed in Balinese script. So you see various spellings of his name in Balinese script, and there are about three or four different variations, and none of them are correct. <laughs> so somebody was not versed in Balinese writing, just uh, they're doing something phonetic, but not, but didn't do it correctly. Okay, so that's one. I, I brought up in the book, but the publisher told me to um, remove it. <laughs> that there were these, um, we might put it back in. in the, um, Eric, can I ask a question? Yeah. Where is this thing? Where is this crystal? Does it exist? Yeah, all these objects exist. They're all in Bali. The, um, the, the, the producer of the book, I would say, Peter Bloch, who was a Danish uh, dentist, and he lives in Beijing, so just to the, the north of me, about four kilometers away, north of me. So during COVID, we all were restricted where there was a lockdown. And I had to pass through um, three checkpoints mm -hmm. along the way from my village to his village. And um, we had to be masked, and because I could pass as a local, 
I didn't have to um be stopped and checked and everything as um as a white down parents would have, have been stopped. Uh, but it's still we do we did have to be masked and everything for this um um thing to occur. Um so we, we worked on that actually good point. We worked on it for about um he started collecting the artifacts just in her in 2019, I think mid-2019, he started locating through his art dealer uh, to find these artifacts. And when COVID set in, there was a German photographer who was stuck at this guy's hotel. Peter Block owns a hotel, and that's where he houses the whole, whole collection. And so this German photographer did most of the photography because he wasn't allowed to leave Bali either. <laughs> so all were kind of stuck on, on the island. Yeah. And then I had to leave um because of family thing. So in 2021 I, I left and the project was put on hold for almost a year. Yeah. And when I went back, then we picked it up again. And then um so we all these objects are in this enormous room, all kind of haphazard right now because it's small. It's not a a big room. I think it's about twice as big as this space right now. And there's an upstairs and downstairs, but it's all kind of um there's no logic to it right now. So um I'll get to what, what's gonna happen at the end of the talk. Okay. But just to show that this is the first time that we actually have a portraiture of a non balinese uh -huh, um, done in wood. Now there was a portraiture done in bronzes in Bali in the before the Javanese influences came in in the 14th century. You have ancestral bronze figures that look kind of like they don't look like these refined gods and goddesses. They kind of look more like regular people. And so you find this also in some of the stone sculptures up in the mountain temples where you find things from the 11th and 12th century that predate Javanese influence. And then they, they look very different from stuff that comes later. Okay, next slide. So um, as he gets more comfortable and well set, he had his own music group and he played the violin. His nephew played, I think, the, the bass or cello. And then any visiting um, Europeans would come in and fill in you know, the music. So they only played European and Danish music, and Western music. There was no interest in Balinese music at all or dance. So there's very few objects that he collected or made that relates to music or dance. So there, there will be a few uh, that I'll show you later on. So uh, you see, he is uh, the one in black in the middle in the painting. Of the same period, and that's him playing his violin. Next slide. <clears throat> Next. Yeah. So then we get um, his main sponsor was the king of uh, Denpasar or Bandung, because Denpasar is only the city, and Bandung is the whole district. And by that point, was divided into nine districts yeah one gets uh dissolved later on um and this uh king who's in the black and white uh, photo or drawing i would think i don't think they had cameras at that point in the 1850s um but um based on this image one image we're able to identify who who this man is in the sculptures with him and there are a number of these, but I put this together because there's a painting of him with the same thing, and then the drawing or whatever that might be, and then the sculpture. And then uh, the gold image there is also of the of the same king. Yeah. So he'll reappear because he granted Matslava the the beach at Kuta to build his port, his uh, trade port. Trade post. Before that, it was a Dutch trading post that didn't do very well because the Dutch didn't know how to deal 
with the Balinese. But the Danish, there were this, this, this guy, Mas Allah knew how to operate um, uh, within the Balinese culture context. He understood right away that what he needed to do was to uh, butter up the case with fancy gifts. So if he had had um, Rolex watches back then, he would have given Rolex watches to or Gucci bags. But something, something of value with a label on it. And his label was this gold or silver monster label. But he, he gave all these luxury gifts to these kings to get trade rights. Uh, next slide. Um, this is him with his uh, Balinese wife, uh, Ni Kanyer. She was actually Gusti Hayu Kanyer. And, um, but because she married a commoner, she lost her, her royal status. It became Ni um, or, or Mrs. <laughs> and uh, that's him dancing with her. Now, this is with the gold mask, the dance like mask. Now the figure is about uh, 43 centimeters high, about this, this tall, less than half a meter, about, you yeah, know, so high. And um, uh, so the mask is about so big, yeah. It's not a, a full, a full human size mask, mask, but it is um, more or less stylish after a Balinese uh, rough dance character mask. And they're dancing. Uh, he's being flirtatious with her. Um, and he does wear the kris on his back. That's the kris that you see in that image there. Next slide. Now, he does get married to her, of course, as I mentioned earlier, because he's pregnant. <clears throat> now, this, these are statues. These are figures that are about this high. They're wooden carved statues. Now, what's unusual? Are the headdresses that they are wearing? Because these are not normal Balinese wedding headdresses. These are dance headdresses for Rama and Sita mm -hmm. for the Ramayana dance, uh, Wayan Wong dance style epic that they do in Mali. Um, so these are scaled down images with the full size tag of her Chris in his back. And um, then we'll see the full size headdresses in. The next slide. Yeah, this is a Rama headdress. There is a full size dance headdress. And the the theater did allow me to put it on. So I did I did put this thing on. This guy had a small head. Yeah, so I have a large head. Anyway, so um it's all gold and handcrafted on leather, cut outs and kind of inside to make the shape and the jewels that are on there. And these jewels he probably got from India, his Indian content. Because mm -hmm. uh, Peter Block did have this uh, special tool that you aim at, at the jewel, and it can tell you what kind of gem it is and how many carats. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and they all are real diamonds and emeralds and rubies. Mm -hmm. And they're massive things. The one on the front is about so big. You know, <laughs> yeah, and all the little ones, the colored ones, about the size of a thumbnail from the front. Yeah, so he wore this for his wedding. And the next slide, and she wore this mm -hmm. for, for her for the wedding. Yeah, See, these are full size uh, dance headdresses, they're not used for weddings. It's completely different, the wedding outfit. But other sculptures in the collection and paintings and and images that he commissioned. He always identified himself as Rama and his family's wife as Sita. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ramayana characters. Okay. Uh, next slide. So we continue our story now. Now, 1840, 1845, there were two Dutch ships that wrecked, and the cargo was loaded. The cargoes were loaded. So this violated their agreement that Dutch kings had, uh, the Balinese kings had with the Dutch. And so 1846, the Dutch launched the first military expedition against Mali. And uh, they attacked the north coast, Singalaga, 
they're bombarded from the sea. And interesting, there's a, a Thai account, Siamese account of this attack because there's a Siamese trader that's in the port of North Bali at that point. And they're eyewitness to account with what's happening. And at one point, a Dutch commander on the ship invites the Thai trader to come over and says, please deliver this letter to the Balinese king um, uh, demanding an apology and compensation. The Siamese king's uh, Siamese, uh, captain says, um, I think you should deliver your son. <laughs> but he knew that was not the Asian way to do things. You have to do it yourself. So it's all in the Siamese account. Uh, so it's interesting putting these different sources together. Um, so uh, the Dutch did attack, they bombarded, and they, they defeated the Balinese. Um, and they had the kings agree to pay compensation for the lunar cargo of the new ship. Now, soon after that, Matsuana marries his Chinese wife, the second wife, and she's the daughter of one of the migrants who, is, who fled China because of all the disruption and came into Southeast Asia. So probably the 1820s, they were to Java first, but probably when they arrived, Java was still pretty crazy because of the Java War, the chaos and then the depression that occurred after that. So they weren't able to survive, so they moved to Bali where they heard things were better because uh, Mazdang also was dealing with some of the Javanese. And so they, they heard that with um, greener pasture in, in Bali. So they moved and he met her there um, and he married her. And um, the Hong Tae Nyo, um, she's from the Hong family uh, lineage. And she became, um, her name became Sang Nyo. Sang is just an honorific for male or female. Um, and Nyo because that's her, her given name. Okay. And Hong is the family. And, yeah. So, um, and soon after that, it gives birth to the daughter, Cecilia Catherine. Oh, that's it. Yeah. So, um, 1848, yeah, it's a very crucial year because, because the Balinese kings refused to pay compensation and the Dutch launched their second uh, military exp expedition against Bali. And uh, this time, the Dutch are soundly defeated because the Balinese have moved east to some extent village and they build not a fortress yet, but what they've done is that they allow the Dutch to invade by land. They've gone up into the foothill, but behind the Balinese start to, to um, destroy everything behind them, behind the Dutch as they're coming in. So when the Balinese uh, attack them from the foothills, the Dutch flee into this wasteland that the Balinese have created. They flooded the fields, it's all muddy, and they burned all the homes. So there's no place for the Dutch forces to stay. So they sleep overnight or summer nights in the village as the Dutch ships from Sinanaja sail over to Sangsit and drop anchor to recover whatever wounded and, um, and uh, recovering troops that are left over in Sangsit. And that's when Lana's wife gives birth to Cecilia Lana. Get a camera. Next slide. Okay. So this is, um, I think, something more um, combining how, we, how uh, Mas Lana saw himself as a negotiator. Because in the first uh, Dutch expedition, uh, he did help to negotiate a peace settlement with the Dutch and the Balinese king. Uh, the second one, he was not needed because the Balinese kings picked out the Dutch. But at this point, there's all these tensions arising. So he sees himself from this Mahabharata episode 
of um, the Sino the Mahabharata, the warring uh, cousins and the five Pandava brothers and their their clan fighting the hundred uh, Rava cousins. And um, here we see Bhima, the, the big red figure above, um, who's the strongest of the Pandavas, um, defeating his cousin. He has his foot on, on the neck of his cousin, um, uh, Duryodhana, who's the head of the rival faction. And Mazlana and his father and his wife are standing there on the side, uh, hoping that peace can be made. And there are the, the clown figures on the side. Um, sort of figure. So this is where we start to see this uh, combined imagery um, that these sculptures start to represent. Um, going out of just seeing yourself as Rama and Sita with his um, Bali's wife, and going now as to um, him and his Bali's wife trying to maintain peace. Next slide. So here's where the Chinese watch. <laughs> so um, it's kind of a, I wouldn't, I don't know whether we could say that that is a portrait of her, but certainly it is a portrait of him. If you look at the paintings and other stuff that were made of uh, Maslana during this time. <clears throat> It might be her because the few images that we have of her do kind of look like this uh, card figure. Okay. Now, because she was born in China, she still was very much uh, this Chinese cultural figure. Um, she wasn't yet assimilated like the the, the Chinese who were there for at least two or three generations or more. Yeah. Yeah. She was not a Paranatan Chinese. She was Chinese from China. So she was fitted at any of the adaptations from uh, Javanese or Balinese culture in her upbringing. So that's the Chinese one. Next slide. And you see here now her, I think she looks kind of pregnant in that picture, <laughs> that painting, and with her parents. And then Matsalama sitting there with the same cane that we were able to locate. Yeah, that same cane that he's holding is what's in the collection. It's made from ivory without gold. It was probably given by her parents to him because the imagery looks more Chinese than Balinese. Although you do have his uh the little letters um that there. I think that is his name, um, which you might have added later on or on the midsection. Um you can see in here is where this is. Yeah, the little larger section of the gold gold band. <clears throat> That's where these things are. The bigger gold things are here. Uh, it's the same king that is holding in this thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, next slide. And here it is for his both wives. <laughs> yeah. So, um, interesting that he made a, a bident. <laughs> Just something, some new word that I learned, not a trident with three, three prongs, but a bident, which is a, a bona fide word, actually does have two prongs. I looked it up and it says, yeah, a bident is a two pronged weapon. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a kiss on the Balinese side and a bident of one word as representing the Chinese side. Now, because uh, the Chinese wife did live with them in Kuta, yeah, so they were separate households, but for both wives, so they're able to uh, get along fairly well, mm -hmm. yeah. But you'll find out that the, the the daughter of the Chinese wife 
became very famous. Okay, next slide. Next, oh yeah. So here we see um, Mazlana uh, with his, the only daughter that he had with the Chinese wife. Um, now, interesting, some of these paintings were located in Thailand. There was a bunch of, uh, a group of uh, Thai, wealthy Thai Chinese uh, collectors who were collecting anything colonial period painting. And they wound up, uh, they had these in their collection. Garrett, yeah. Do I see the date 1851 on? Yeah, 1851. The style yeah. is so much what I would say advanced for that time. It, it looks like impressionism, mm -hmm. which was much later. It, it, they seem really avant garde. Um, if you look at what, like, um, and to think what year is um, um, the Dutch, uh, the Javanese, uh, Rajan Sali was painting in the 1830s. It's very much this European influence style. Yeah. So probably this painter, Chinese uh, painter living probably on the north coast of Bali, where all the European influences were coming in. Um, so I would think that's where the style comes in from. Yeah. Because we don't have many paintings from Bali during the 1830s. We have more stuff from Java where the clone, the, uh, the Dutch work. Um, but uh, again, if you do look at what Rodin Saleh was doing, he was a toast in Europe because he went to um, to um, the, um, the Holland and became such a a European gentleman, <laughs> and he painted very beautiful, completely realistic um, paintings, um, European style painting. Nothing Indonesian or Japanese about his paintings, completely European style. I think it's 1830s. Yeah. So, early, just before that, it's not the 1850s. <clears throat> Next slide. Yeah. So in 1849, we have the third Dutch military expedition, which is sort of a, a punitive expedition against the against the Balinese because they had won the second the second war expedition that was sent into, into Bali. And this time <clears throat> the Balinese got advanced warning and way up in the mountains in Jagaraga village in East Bali, they built an enormous fortress. Ah, yeah. So when the Dutch arrived, the Balinese had a great advantage. And they had they had some firearms and cannons that they captured from the Dutch before. And they were able to bombard uh, the Dutch as they came up. But what happened was that the Dutch did a sneak attack from behind because the, the rear side of the fort was not guarded. So they went upstream and came behind and attacked from behind the Dutch fortress and slaughtered the Balinese in the fort. And that's when they, the Dutch were able to defeat the Balinese. Now the King of Bolilin, you know, which is in North Bali, he fled, he fled out into the Bangli area, just to the south of Bolilin, up into the Kitamani Batu area. But the King of Bali was an enemy um, because of land disputes. So the King of Bali of um, Bulaleng fled over to Karanasam in East Bali. And that's where he was uh, killed uh, by rival troops from the Balinese rival factions in Lombok that the Dutch had hired to fight this war. <clears throat> At this point, um, when the the Dutch get the upper hand. Then they sail down over to, to East Bali and wound up in Patabai, the port where Mazlana had landed, because it's only only a viable port that's now in the eastern part of Bali. And um uh their troops 
disembark and they start marching by land over to the border uh, with Sumaraputa and Plunko. Uh, next one. Don't advance yet. Yeah. yeah. Back to the, yeah. <clears throat> um, so uh, there are 3,000 Dutch troops that march into the border. If you know Bali, the back cave of, you know, Kusaba or Lawa, which is used for uh, secondary death threats. It's a very, it's a small cave, but it's inhabited by hundreds of thousands of uh, bats. And there's a supposed link from the back cave up to the Saki Temple, to the Lava Kim, to the Saki Temple is, is the main temple in Bali. And that's where there are death rites that link it up to the, the Temple of the Dead up at the Saki. And so to have the Dutch encamped in this very sacred site, and the uh, Balinese king, who is the superior king over in Sumatra, Porto, and Klumpo, right on the border, and did not sit well. <clears throat> so they call in all the troops from all over Bali, and 33,000 Balinese troops amass in Klumpo, mm -hmm. and they're going to go to war with. 3,000 Balinese troops, uh, Dutch troops. So there's going to be a slaughter that's, that's about to happen. And Maslava negotiates a peace settlement without a shot being fired. Now, what works to advantage is that prior to this, the Balinese only were, the, the Balinese kings only were dealing with merchants. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> there's a German uh, noble that comes in as a representative of the Dutch. And the Balinese kings finally feel they have someone of equal status to start talking with. And so uh, Sir Bertrand uh, from Germany, he comes in as a representative of the Dutch and they negotiate a settlement because the Balinese finally feel they can talk with uh, a German normal. Okay. So then peace is made in Kuta, and then that settlement is made. In 1850, um, Andres Emil, I sort of skipped over the first son because he's not that important, but Andres Emil, the second son of, um, with his Balinese wife, gets born. Now, <clears throat> because of education, um, Maslama sent his first son, William Peter, to Singapore, to be educated in the British system there. And he dies of this in June. He was born, I think, in 1849, 1848 or something. And um, so he died at a young age in Singapore. <clears throat> uh, next slide. Okay. Now, here we see three important figures. Yeah. The Battle of Jagaraga. <clears throat> That took that that uh, extended over to Southeast Bali into Klungkong at the Bat Gate that I mentioned. Now the the commander he leads the troops over to the Bat Cave area and he encamps there. Now Bali is ruled by a queen at that point, the Virgin Queen of Bali, but she never gets married, <clears throat> and uh, she's first in. Um, magic and mysticism. So she has a sacred weapon, um, a gun and bullets. And the gun is supposedly made from the thigh bone of a human. <laughs> and the bullets are made, are in their lead, their lead shot, but encased in the middle are the organs, the cooked up organs of this human that was sacrificed to make this weapon. So the liver, the heart, uh, the lungs probably, now were cooked, mashed up and put into these lead bullets. The sacred gun and sacred bullets. So the queen of our Klumko, or Samarapura, she goes out, makes the offerings, recites the magic uh, um, mantras, and she fires the gun. And like a magic bullet, it goes miles and miles away 
up and down across the landscape. And then gets the ballot, the Dutch commander in his thigh and shatters his thigh. They take him onto the ship and, uh, that's off the coast in um, Arambai. And by sunrise, he's bled to death. So the Balinese queen has killed the Dutch commander of the troops. Now, uh, this is the guy in the middle. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, yeah. So um, the one with the one on the left side, on the left, the left side, yeah, your left. Um, he's the king of the north coast of Bali at that point. <clears throat> In Maslana, he's on the right. So um, <clears throat> before the Dutch commander is killed. <clears throat> they sort of try to negotiate a peace, but um doesn't come to any any uh, fruition at that point. So that's when the Dutch commander sails around the coast and launches an attack because the Balin, another Balinese king has escaped over and they're gonna meet up and the Balinese king will get killed over in the foothill of East Bali. <clears throat> Next slide. Now here's the the important uh, weapon of Chris that gets our uh, main to commemorate <clears throat> the battle of uh, Kusamba in East Bali, where the back gate is located. There's a portrait painting of Madhulana that the um, the Chris maker, the sheep maker, made to imitate his portrait. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, here's the battle of uh, Kusaba and the and the peace negotiation that was uh, made and the the uh, to have a Chris with a uh, a storyboard, yeah, uh, on a sheet was uh had never been done before. Usually, it was something mythological, or more decorative, or some god or goddess uh, figure uh, for protection was uh, inside on the gold sheet. But he you now have uh, three scenes uh, to illustrate um, at first um, uh, Mazlana at the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. And Mazlana is sitting in the middle in the, the slide on the, on the uh, left side uh, with um, the king of Kisiman. Now we know the king of Kisiman, he always carried a cane and he never wore a shirt of any short of any sort. So the of the earlier image, the king of Kesiman, um, he's uh he's identifiable because um he never wore a head cloth and just wore a chest cloth. So he's sitting with Mazlana and a Dutch commander at the negotiating table. And they go Mazlana in the upper upper image, sends over his horse cart to pick up the King of Plonkong. But the King, the King of Plonkong is too old, so he sends his nephew over, because he never had any, he never had any children. So he sends his nephew over as his representative to the negotiation. And in the image below, in Kuta, that's where they actually sign the peace treaty. The three images, um, the Kusamba War and the Peace Treaty that gets um, uh, made, that's um, uh, documented in this um, uh, sheet of the crest that was made <clears throat> for this event. Next slide. And finally, um, when the negotiation gets set, set up, a bunch of um, a group of uh, Balinese nobles, not royalty, but the nobles, they get sent over to Batavia or Jakarta to work with the uh, Dutch um, administrators there. And then here in the sculpture, you see Maslan in the middle, uh, 
trying to negotiate a peace between the Dutch and Gusti Madirai, who was the king of North Bali at that point. You can see his satellite. I love his expression in the photo that he's kind of like, you know, caught in the middle. And this big mouth uh, Dutch man, <laughs> Dutch commander, <laughs> military officer, fighting with uh, Gusti Madirai. Now we know this is Gusti Madirai, the king of North Bali, because he's always wore this red headdress and this uh, red head cloth and this red head cloth. And he had this very thick mud there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so because the Dutch at this point had rejected Gusti Madirai as the king of North Bali, they wanted to put in their own candidate, one of these candidates that was more, more friendly to their, their, um, their eventual occupation of North Bali. <clears throat> so this is their fight over who's going to become. No, the Dutch didn't want what the Balinese wanted. Their king, the Dutch didn't agree with that. Okay, next slide. And these are paintings of, uh, of um, again, you think it's kind of modern style, but look at what uh, Rajan Saleh was doing in the 1830s. It's very much in the style of uh, what Rajan Saleh was doing. Yeah. So we have these uh, paintings of um, Mads Lana with his Balinese wife, Gustiayu uh, Penier, or Nyai Penier, because Nyai is a more honorific um, kind of form royal woman. And you see her with their two sons, uh, Peter and Andrea Camille, younger and older son. Peter, the older son, and Emil, Andrea Camille, the younger son. So again, these were located in Thailand from a Thai Chinese collection. Interesting enough. Yeah. Okay. So here maybe is the previous slide. The previous slide. Yeah. Uh, the, the next one. Next slide. Next. No. The, no, I advanced. I advanced the slides after this one. Yeah. Do you see um Kusta Ayer, how you how you can hear looks like she's expecting. Looks fairly um pregnant. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then her two sons can get on that side. Okay, next. Yeah. So um <clears throat> Maslana riding his faithful white horse. Mm -hmm. Uh now trying to look through um match it up with some other image. The only image I've come up with that was the nearest image to this was this painting in 1850. And why are these uh, Balinese warriors behind them? <clears throat> it's because they're, they're warriors that are going to dance for the cremation of the king of Tonko, or Sumarapura, based on the years. And we figured out that Matsalana came for the cremation of Tonko, of the king of Tonko. And when he was arriving, the dancers went out to meet him and escorted them into the palace. Next slide. Now this is a Maslava with the king of North Bali, Gusti mm -hmm. Rai, his red head cloth and, and red um, um, chest cloth. So um, we're trying to figure out what what are they holding in their hands? It was probably a proclamation <clears throat> from the Dutch Indian government finally saying, okay, we'll recognize Christi Madirai as the king of North Bali. Yeah. So we don't know exactly, but based on the imagery and what probably could be uh, something um, um, that they're agreeing on. Yeah, they look pretty chummy in the photograph, in the sculpture. Yeah. So um, I think also the year is 1850 for this sculpture. Yeah. Now here we can sort of like um, start getting into 
uh, how the kings were relating to uh, Matsulana. So here's Matsulana on the on the left side. Yeah, dressing well in his headdress and everything. And his main sponsor with the guy without the hefla who granted him the land in Kuta. That's um uh Kustigade Mura Kusiman, the king of Kusiman in Denpasar. Because Denpasar was ruled by three royal houses. <clears throat> and his was the most powerful royal house at that time, Kusiman. So we know for sure, uh, based on the imagery of that this is Mazlana and his main sponsor, and they're front and back of the sculpture. Now, who are the other two kings on the slide? Next slide. Okay, we have this uh, <clears throat> very young looking king on the right side. And this guy with the stick mustache and looks like some kind of headdress poking up from his crown. And that probably is again, the king of North Bali, Gusti Magni Lai, the king who was just recognized as the king of North Bali, just about the same time as 1850, where the old king of Hong Kong passed away and his nephew uh, took power. That's why you have this young looking uh, king who was, I think, 14 years old when he came to power. And then you have the um, the king of North Bali with a stick mustache, easy to be recognized. Uh, um, so these are the two kings on the sides of the sculpture. And there's a double coronation of these two kings. Mm -hmm. That's why they're recognized in this sculpture with four figures. And then each holding a clip. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> Now, here's something, you know, sort of a uh, very strange put on there. Finally, we have the, um, everything's kind of in a peaceful, peaceful situation. The, the, um, the kings have all signed the peace treaty in Kota after the war in Kosamba following the Dutch, Third Dutch War uh, expedition to Bali. So all the kings have sort of come together, negotiated this case. And <clears throat> so there are, um, there are actually nine kings in Bali at this point, but only eight are represented because the ninth king didn't have to come to the Dutch negotiation because he was the one who was thrown out. The Dutch king of the Bali's king of uh, Bangli in Sichuan. Sichuan. So the other eight kings all had to come to the negotiation table and work out this peace settlement. So this culture commemorates this actually this grand peace settlement that came about after the war. Uh, so you actually have Maslana in the front, but I won't show his image again. And the other eight kings arranged politically um, around him. Okay. So <clears throat> um, it's hard to have to go back and forth between these two images um, <laughs> because the back of the image has um, his father in law, who's the king of Tabanan. And his sponsor, uh, the king of uh, Kusiman in Padum, Kustimura Gade Kusiman. So they form this, this uh, uh, trio that divides the other six kings into two factions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they form this, this line in the middle of the sculpture. So on the right hand side, which is always the superior side, of Bali, the mm -hmm. uh, upper level side versus left end. You have the, uh, the now you have the uh, king of Klumpo with his mustache. He's grown up now. 
And um, I think the king of, let's look at the, the next slide. Yeah, should we get the next slide? Yeah, here's more easy to see the division. Um, who's who? Because uh, Maslam, if you think of in the middle of the side, in order to put his future, but these are the, what we think are the eight kings of Bali at this point. Because there's no, except for the king of uh, Badung or Kasiman down below, uh, we have no real other image except the king of Mulele with his mustache and red headdress. Um, so we're sort of making suppositions based on the relative positions in the sculpture that the higher rank kings, okay, which actually be on the right hand side of the book, <laughs> on the right hand side, are um, where is it? yeah, Kong. Uh, Kong and Mangui were friends. Yeah. So they're on the upper side. But uh, now, Nyanya, the king of Nyanya, who is not so powerful, he's lower rank and on the left side of the sculpture, the lower ranking side of the sculpture. Okay. So we took have to think Mazdan is in the front, his father in law is above him, and uh, the king of um, Badu is his sponsor, is behind him. Uh, one who's been backing him up. Okay. So on the other side of the sculpture, you have the king of Karalasa, who's pretty fair, fairly high up, and almost equal rank with the king of Wuyale. So they're up at the top of the sculpture. And below, over the West Bali, is the king of Jabrana. Is almost powerless. So he's on the left side of the sculpture, but on the lower side. So whoever carved the sculpture really understood the political division that were going on. That you had Mazlana, his father in law, and the king of Denpasan separating these two factions. The upper, more powerful kings of Karagasum and Bunaleng. On the right side, high ranking, with the lower ranking king of Yanya. And on the other side of the sculpture, the left side, you have the high ranking kings of Rung Kong and Mengui, with um, the lower ranking Yanya king below him. It's this, all this, how this is figured out, I don't know. It's this a sheer work of genius, whoever did this, to show. From multiple divisions of the eight kingdom in Bali at this point. <clears throat> okay. Each of them has a jewel in their forehead. This shows the back <clears throat> of the sculpture. The top is his father in law, the king of Tabanan, and below, from the other image, you see the king of Badong Kasiman, this um, balding older king, um, uh, who never wore a headdress. Okay, next slide. Oh, we go backwards. Four. Yeah. And that might be it, maybe. Yeah. Four. Oh, okay. So, um, something's missing. Something's missing here. Go back one. <clears throat> oh, something happened. I go forward one and then another. Something out of order. No, something didn't get. Something's not on here. Okay, there's a. Go back to the. Yeah, this one. Okay, there is a. There's supposed to be an image of um, Mazlana watching Hanuman meet up with the mermaid. Because <clears throat> uh, as he's building. The, the causeway, the lanka, the monkeys are throwing the boulders into the sea, and they're all disappearing. They're all disappearing beneath the waves. So Hanuman gets sent below the waves, 
He sees the, the golden mermaid, who is the queen of the sea. He's having all the fish take the boulders away. So the uh, never gets spilled. <clears throat> so some, the story you find in Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, and some writings in Java do mention it. But, um, but Bali's writings, uh, stories don't mention the story at all. So it's coming, because I talked to Dalans, uh, puppeteers in Bali, you know this golden mermaid story? So no, there's no, no clue about this golden mermaid story. Uh, the Javanese, some of them know it, but not all. But Cambodia certainly, Thailand, see it in dances and paintings, sculptures all over. So Hanuman goes below the sea, he sees the golden mermaid, and they fall in love. And he makes love, and she eventually tells the fish to bring back the borders and rebuild the causeway. So on this huge sculpture, you know why it doesn't appear, are these uh, 17 little gold inscriptions that are on the sculpture. And these are the 17 inscriptions that tell pretty much Mahat Swami's life. From the time he went from Lombok to Bali, all the way to the time when he feels like he has to leave. So the, the, the ship feels either getting the land in Kuta, meeting up the, the king of Kasiman, marrying the Bali's wife, <clears throat> living there, and then um, becoming the Dutch agent, which I didn't get into detail, but also meeting with his uh, Chinese wife, the defeat of um, General Michel's, mm -hmm. the Battle of Jagaraga, and then becoming the King of Bali, the King of Bali, he never became the King of Bali, but the King of the economy, the trade of Bali, because he was the one who really was able to negotiate these uh, trade deals. Um, the Danish were not uh, colonialists, they came just as traders all over Asia. <clears throat> the Dutch were more to other things. Um, so, um, yeah, so Mats Lama really was able to, by giving all these fancy gifts to all these kings, all these gold and jewelry class of Christmas in particular, and sculptures to put in their temples and all these magnificent uh, objects, uh, he gained favor because he knew the Balinese really loved gifts to receive gifts. Very, very Asian to give gifts to gain favor. Yeah. So these are the 17 really important incidents in his life up to the point where he wants to return to Denmark. Mm. Next slide, yeah. So eventually, just as the on like a few days before he's gonna returned to Denmark, gets invited to dinner by the rival king of uh, Denpasar. So his rival, who is the king of Bado, or Kisiman, gets a rival of the king of Denpasar. There are three kings. And so he gets invited to dinner, and the king of um, Denpasar puts, puts arsenic in his food, because arsenic is used to create the patterns of cliffs. So he had he had um he had access to arsenic. And arsenic is you can't taste it in your food or drink. Um and the symptoms that he displayed, because it hits you very fast, and the symptoms he displayed are all signs of arsenic poisoning. Yeah. So we know that he gets uh, killed by arsenic poisoning by the king of Denpasan. Um, so his nephew uh, sends uh, the two children, the two remaining children, over because um, um, Andreas already has died from dysentery in Singapore. So he sends over his two remaining children, his younger son and his daughter, Cecilia Catherine, 
over to Singapore, you know, for schooling and to be cared for. <clears throat> to be cared for. Yeah. So in Singapore <clears throat> is where the children mainly become international mm -hmm. because uh Andreas when he graduates um he becomes secretary to uh Charles Bro, who's the nephew of James Bro, who's the first white Raja of Sarawak mm -hmm. in the book British of course. So he becomes secretary. <clears throat> uh, but Cecilia is the one who becomes the real uh, prominent one. Because when she gets sent over to Singapore, she's put into, I think, the, the, one of the Rafa schools. She's very young at this point. Um, and she meets the Sultan of Johor because Johor rules Singapore at that point. And she meets the Sultan, they fall in love, and they get married. And she gets, gets birth to their first daughter, Mariam. Uh, and she gives birth to the son, Mir Seher Ibrahim. Yeah. So what happens is that Ibrahim, when his father, the Sultan of Johor, passes away, he becomes the next Sultan of Johor. So it's Lama's, Mas Lama's grand, grandson is sitting on the throne of Jamor. Now his sister, uh, Mariam, I think went, went to the timeline, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Mariam, Cecilia also gives birth to her daughter named Mariam. And she, goes up to, um, when she comes of age, she marries into the Ahang royal family up in uh, North Central Malaysia, inland Malaysia. So she, that's the biggest state actually in Malaysia. So she marries the king of, of Ahang, the Sultan of Ahang. And um, she doesn't have children. He's old at this point. I think the Sultan also is quite dated. So it's more marriage to make alliances. Okay. So that's Cecilia, her husband, the Sultan Abu Bakr of, uh, of Jabor, and her daughter. Okay, next slide. So when Andres retires in 1905, he moves back to Singapore with his Malay wife. They, they had 12 children. <laughs> uh, Five girls and seven boys, I think. Yeah. And a few years later, Andres passes away. And his great big clan still lives in Singapore, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand, Portugal, and the United Kingdom. I heard in the US now, somebody told me their family in the US. The environment mentioned mentioned married the Sultan of uh, Pahang, but didn't have any children. In 1927, the Dutch colonial government builds a monument to Lana on his grave on Jalan Tuan Lana, on, on Mr. Lana Street. Yeah. In 1932, Ismail, <clears throat> uh, I can't think how these names I get mixed up with the. Um, <laughs> Uh, Mas Lala's great grandson is born. The Cecilia passes away in 1939. Next slide. Mm -hmm. And decide, went to Singapore and filmed and took these photographs of Lala Road. You can see Jensen or Johnson, uh, which is also <clears throat> a Danish name. Yeah, because I think, uh, um, one of Mazlama's workers was uh, somebody named Jensen and became Johnson, Johnson in, in Singapore. This is the area. There's the only three houses left. You have all these modern high rise condo, uh, everything torn down. But these, the only three houses left there are these. And they're right across the street from each other. So I think this is where, where Maz 
Maslana's uh, family, uh, where his son actually lived with this. It's a big compound, it's upper one. Yeah. And the right across the street are these twin houses, uh, small houses. Now I knocked, I knocked on some of the doors. And <laughs> the only thing I could get, they had no idea the history of the street they lived on. And they call it Mage Road because there's a street called Range Road in Singapore. So they call it Range Road. They said, no, it's Lana, because it's Danish. So they had no clue about the history of the street that they're living on. Yeah, that's quite interesting. But it's nice to know how style house, houses, only three remaining houses. It's the bottom, the big house is at the bottom of the road. And right across the street, there are these two little Malay style houses. Yeah, and that's it. Everything else are these big high rise developments around them. Yeah. But there's nothing left of Mas Lama's uh, factory and warehouses in Bali. Yeah. It was just uh, in the north of the airport. And um, there's nothing there now except big hotels and shopping centers. And they tore down anything that was of Mas Lama's uh, legacy that was there. Next slide, if there's any. Next slide. Yeah. So this gets the. Um, 1927, the Dutch uh, built a memorial. The Dutch, uh, the Japanese, when they came in, they tore it down. So during the Japanese occupation of <clears throat> World War II of uh, Bali, they tore it down. They could tore everything down. Yeah. And in 1940, uh, 45, some descendants from Mads, known as Chinese one, they went back to Johor. And his uh, grandson is sitting on, on the throne, and he asked for funds from Mahatma's grandson to rebuild the shrine. And they do. In 1959, uh, that grandson passes away, and the great grandson of Mahatma becomes a Sultan of Jahor. Now, in 1960, in my timeline, um, okay, Sultan Mahmoud's uh, wife gives birth to a daughter. He had the son, you know, it's kind of, it's good visit. The present uh, Sultan of Jahor at this point is the great grandson of Mazlana. Now, his sister <laughs> is born in 1960. Mm -hmm. And in 61, that Sultan of Johor, who's the great grandson of Mazlana, passes away. And in 1981, <clears throat> His great great, Maslama's great great grandson takes on the throne as a Sultan of Jabor. Can you follow this? It's kind of confusing. <clears throat> um, this is our next slide. Yeah, so this is what it looks like now in Bali that this, um, <clears throat> this monument was redone for the 200th birth. Of Mazlana in um, what year was that? Um, 2007 was his 200th birthday. He was born in 1807. Yeah, yeah. So 200 years later, they're going to do a 200 bicentennial, 200 year bicentennial mm -hmm. of his birth. And so they, they really do the monument. And everything is redone. So this is our done for Lana <laughs> in the next slide. And this is what it looked like in 1950, the monument. So before the restoration. So pretty much what they, the Dutch had, had done to restore it. And then the next slide. Oh, do I have a, can I see the next slide? 
another side. I think we have, yeah, this is on this side. Sorry, this is what it looked like for the restoration. Mm -hmm. Now, what they kept was this uh, marble plaque from the original monument was kept, was kept and, and put onto the, the restored monument, you see on the left there. Now go back a uh, couple slides. Go back. Yeah, one more. Just a timeline. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Okay, stop here. So 1960, 1986, um, Aziza was Mariam, and Mariam is, is Cecilia's daughter. And Cecilia is Mas uh, granddaughter. Yeah, the Cecilia was his wife, and so um, his daughter. So the granddaughter's daughter, the great granddaughter, marries the Sultan of Bahar in 1986. And that same year, uh, Andreas's great great granddaughter is crowned Miss Singapore. Yeah. <laughs> and she re she represents uh, uh, Singapore at the Miss Universe. Pageant in 1986. In 2007, the monument gets restored for the bicentennial. And in 2010, Ibrahim Ismail, who is Lala's great 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 grandson, becomes a Sultan of Javor. And then 2019, Aziza, who is a great great granddaughter, of Maslana becomes the Queen of Malaysia when her husband, the Sultan of Maham, then becomes the King of Malaysia. Yeah. So, you know, there's a, an alternating system, a rotating system is who becomes the King of Malaysia. I think every five years, there's a new King, a new Sultan, the next Sultan, and they take turns. So, 1919, <clears throat> The Sultan of Paham became the next king of Malaysia. So his wife was the great 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 granddaughter of Maslama became the queen. Yeah. So we have this woman who's uh uh what one thirty second Dutch. <laughs> yeah, she's one thirty second Dutch. Yeah. Oh um, Danish. Danish, sorry, Danish. Yeah. And then in 2022, we launched this book, this new book that is got published for the G20 meeting, yeah, in Bali. So um right now we're negotiating <clears throat> the future of this book because not too many people. Uh, you can see the book there. Not too many people can afford. A seven hundred and fifty dollar book. So we're negotiating with this new um, Garuda Vishnu Kanchana, a statue of the of uh, the god Vishnu from the Garuda bird, way in the south of the island. Now they're building a museum, and they are interested in housing the collection at the museum there, and then publishing a one volume, smaller edition of this two volume book that will be more affordable. So we're negotiating right now we can do this. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a confusing history because we're taking into account uh, this eruption of the volcano, which also led to a, a, a plague. There was a, a car plague that broke out in Bengal <clears throat> as a result of that. So we're saying every hundred years, there's, there's these Pandemics. That's right. We had the uh, Spanish flu in 1917. Then in 1819 or so, we had the the um the Karma uh, epidemic that broke out. And then we just had 2019 COVID. So you know it's kind of every hundred years something is gonna happen, it seems that um, disrupts the economy, the social systems, political systems around the world. Um, any questions? <laughs> I 
Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I have quite a lot of questions, <laughs> uh, uh, but I'll try to limit it to the ones that that might have answers. Mm -hmm. uh, my first question is 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 so he's born in 1807 yeah. in Denmark. If one were to use an educated guess, you would probably assume he was baptized in like the Lutheran Church of Denmark. Mm -hmm. um, of course. Christianity, they're like, when it comes to marriage, they're really opposed to two things, incest and polygamy. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't seem like polygamy really bothered him, um, or at least in the way that we would imagine a Christian would be bothered. That's by. a very good question, because it turns out that as he was realizing he had to return to Denmark, that he couldn't take his two wives with him. Mm -hmm. And his, <laughs> his um, three half-breed children he couldn't take them with him. That's why he sent them to Singapore. Yeah, oh. <clears throat> but also that he was in this bind that he knew he couldn't take them back, wives and children back to Denmark. So what was he going to do with them? He conveniently, <laughs> he got poisoned. <laughs> yeah, so he couldn't take any of them. Back. So yeah. to continue on that question, he's in Bali. Yeah. Um, he's as a uh, Balinese Hindu first wife yeah. and the second wife Chinese probably practiced yeah Chinese yeah. probably multiple religions kind of playing yeah. at one. Uh -huh. Um he's involving himself in the royal families of Bali. So I mean I'm I'm gonna go on a limb and say he probably doesn't have a, a, a Lutheran minister able to to yeah. give him any sacraments or baptize his children. So do we know what about his spiritual life? And I guess the best question I could see is, yeah, yeah if, if you go to his grave, what does his grave indicate? Because that might be yeah. some indication of something. Yeah. Well, he's, he's buried <clears throat> right next to the Chinese cemetery yeah. where his wives and sisters are buried. Mm. Yeah, mm. right next door. The monument is right there. And... Um, he often saw his Chinese wife as a human incarnation of the Bodhisattva mm -hmm. Huan Yin. There's one figure, which I didn't include, I should have included, of her standing next to him, and she looks like Huan Yin. Yeah. So she was very much Buddhist because he did give to her family um, a Burmese. A uh, Buddhist statue, a lacquer uh, Buddhist statue from um, Mandalay, based on the style. So he, that was part of the dowry that he gave to his wife's family so he could marry in her. Yeah, so she was Buddhist for sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Why did he feel he had to go back to Denmark? Um, okay, mostly because the business. Started to fail because as soon as the Dutch came in, they shifted all the focus to North Bali, mm -hmm. where the new port was opening up. So Kuta became neglected. And it was easier <clears throat> uh, to ship the rice um, from Bulaling over to Singapore mm -hmm. and other points in Asia than it was from Kuta. Because yeah. Kuta, yeah, the reefs. The rough serve in the more distance. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One more question? There's a question on the Zoom. Anything on the Zoom? Thank you. Please don't send my warm regards to the Garrett and thanks for introducing fascinating projects. No need to be fun. Well, that's great, but maybe we should stop there. Then. That questions? was a really nice, that was a nice reading. I think oh. we should just say thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate your patronage. Mm -hmm. Thanks all for coming and attending. Cool. Yeah, there is the one sculpture. Yeah, that's the that elongated sculpture. Yeah, that's it. Oh, uh, do you know who actually did the sculptures? No, we don't. We have no, no. Yeah. Now the sculptures themselves, 